So uh, I appreciate uh, being uh, invited. It's seldom that I get to come and speak at a conference and not actually leave home. And also uh, this is, although I've talked on many panels about being a woman scientist, I don't think I've ever talked about my research to a room that has more women than men in it. So it uh, could be unnerving for me. Um, anyway, so I'm just going to talk about, unlike yesterday, which had a lot to do with you know, the mysteries of the universe, uh, I actually, although I'm a faculty member here in the Department of Physics and Astronomy, um, all my degrees are actually in engineering. Uh, and I've always walked the line between physics and engineering. And my undergrad was engineering physics from McMaster. And then I went to Rochester where they have an institute of optics, but that's actually housed in their college of engineering. So there you go. So I'm much more a person as a kid that li liked playing with Lego. So I've become a person who likes to play with lasers. Uh, I build lasers that other people don't have, and they're intense lasers, so we can do nonlinear optics with it. Uh, so what I'm going to talk to you about today, though, is starting with a short pulse intense laser to do a nonlinear optical experiment to make an even shorter, more intense pulse in the end. It's sort of a circle. We keep going. So there's many reasons why you might use short pulses, but one of them is just so you can see something that's happening very fast. So I don't actually know what the controversy was in 1877, but there was this big controversy. About, and so I think it might have been like, you know, at the Olympics when they were speed walking, you have to have people watching to make sure you're not actually having two feet come off the ground at the same time because that's running, that's not walking. So this is some kind of horse trot gait. I don't know, I'm not a horse person, but whatever. And in 1877, there was this big controversy, do all feet in this trot come out off the ground at the same time? And, you know, our eyes can only see 25 milliseconds at a time. And so some people saw it, some people didn't, you know. What could you do? This man, Edward Meyerbridge, which I don't actually know his real name, he changed it to that, he liked this one better. But anyways, this guy used technology to say I can figure it out and he came up with stop motion photography and this is the one right there. All four legs are off the ground and he solved this great burning mystery of 1877. To do it he needed flashes of light that were on the order of a millisecond, which in 1877 was pretty good. I will tell you the uh, world record right now is 63 attoseconds, 63 times 10 to the minus 18 seconds. All right, and that actually, that achievement was actually made it all the way to the TV show Big Bang Theory when it happened so that everybody in the world could know about how fast laser pulses can be made. So optical people aren't stopped by those pesky things that other physicists, things called mass. So that's why we can have very short pulses. So that's great, that's a millisecond. The other thing I want you to take note though is that the horse is a big thing. And so Edward Mybridge had to figure out how to make his pulse short, but he didn't also have to figure out how to make his camera see something small. He could just use regular photography because the horse is much bigger and we aren't talking about whether the feet are coming off on the scale of a micron, the feet came well off the uh, ground. So now though, if we want to go to the shorter and shorter pulses and actually the out of second world, is trying to see electrons move. I'm not going to go that short. We're going to go to single femtoseconds, hopefully. Haven't done it yet. Um, and what moves in, in that time, this is molecules moving. The atoms inside molecules will move on the order of femtoseconds, the lightest molecule being hydrogen, and that vibrational mode is two femtoseconds. So if we can get down to single femtoseconds, we can see it. Now, I'll apologize to all of my quantum friends because they don't like to say molecules are these ping pong balls. But let's face it, that's where we're all going to see these things <laughs> in our heads. But these ping pong balls of atoms are much, much smaller than the wavelength of light. And so we don't get to use a regular camera. Even if I can get the laser pulses down to single femtoseconds, which I say I haven't done yet, um, we can't just use a regular camera. And so this is uh, part of the reasons why I'm not doing attoseconds. Attoseconds, fabulous but their efficiency of getting there is very low. So they're not going to do nonlinear optical experiments with their attosecond pulses yet. And I'm hoping to do nonlinear optics with my single femtosecond. So how can we see these molecules and how can we actually image them that these molecules will move? My colleague Joe Sanderson, who has the lab next to me, I told him probably 15 years ago I was working on this. I'm going to get it ready for him. He's still waiting. But anyways, I stole these pictures um, from the web. I don't know the actual people who did this work, but <laughs> That's all right, they have a beautiful picture. So let's have this hypothetical four ping pong ball atom here. And it's the same idea is, is that when Mybridge tried to see the horse, he didn't just take one picture. He had to take a picture in series, he had to time them to go along with the motion so the camera was aimed at the horse at the time the picture was being taken. It's the same idea is that 
ultra-fast people want to see dynamic reactions, right? Our spectroscopy friends in chemistry that have high-resolution lasers can see the ground states, can see the steady state, things better than we can. Their uh, frequency resolution is still better than the time resolution. But what they can't see is a process, a dynamic process as you go through it. So the idea would be you'd have some short laser pulse and create some excitement in, amongst these atoms. And then you would time up the difference time between the next pulse and you would then ionize some or all of the atoms. Okay? So people kept talking yesterday about first year physics. I actually uh, will talk about this when I teach second year E&M, except that I had a student tell me to keep my research out of the classroom. Um, yeah, I know, what can I tell you? Anyway, because this, this is a great example of how you can you know, use your uh, very beginning parts of E&M. So as we all know though, when we show the students the pith balls and you know, how they come apart because you charge both of them, and you do the little calculation and all you need is one charge against one charge, when they're just an angstrom apart, sub-nanometer apart, tremendous, tremendous force. This is why this type of spectroscopy is called Coulomb explosion spectroscopy, because once you've ionized more than one of those atoms sitting that angstrom apart, boom, off they go. And then you use this time of flight, which again is an electric field, taking the ions up here. So if it starts to go down this way and has to come back, it arrives at the detector later. So you can tell if it was going towards the detector, away from the detector. You use a 2D detector to get all the momentum the other way. So you can determine the kinetic energy, and from that you get back to the potential energy, which tells you how the atoms were sitting at the time it exploded. But you don't want it to be averaged over the vibration. That's why we want single femtoseconds. But we have to have it intense enough to strip these electrons. So you need laser fields like 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13 watts per square centimeter. And just to get your feel for that, at 10 to the 13, that's when the electric field, the force on that electron, QE, is equal to the force that's holding the electron to the molecule. And so the electron would just as happily leave the molecule at that point. Okay? So we want to have an intense thing. I should tell you, because we're talking about women here, um, the first nonlinear optics experiment couldn't be done until the laser was invented in 1960. So frequency doubling is the first nonlinear optics experiment done in 1961. But actually, theorists who aren't constrained by technology, uh, they can think of these things long before the experimentalists can do them. And it was a woman, Maria Gapert Meyer, who many of you might know for a different reason, um, came up with the theory of multiphoton excitation in 1939. Okay, I had to wait a long time, and I don't think she actually survived to actually see the first multiphoton effect. Um, this is not what she won the Nobel Prize for, though. But this is how far we've come, because you know she followed her husband. He was a chemist, and he went from job to job, and she only got to be um, paid to do slight office work, but was given an office to do this slight office work, and then in the rest of her time, she was allowed to do her research. She was just a few years from getting a Nobel Prize, which she did for a different work altogether, nuclear, uh, and that's when she finally started getting paid as a scientist. So we have come some way, because I'm not doing Nobel Prize winning research, and I get paid to be a scientist. So there you go. The things have changed since the 1930s. All right, so that's what I'm trying to do. Um, so how do we get a short pulse? It's just some Fourier transforms. If you have a lot of uh, colors and you can time them all up at some point in time, then you make a pulse. And of course, just from destructive interference with all these colors, uh, it, the field has to go away. And so that's how we make short pulses. It's how we make mode lock laser pulses. Be short, the different frequencies are the different modes in the cavity. Those are separated by C over two times the length of the cavity. So that's usually 100 megahertz to a gigahertz, all right, kind of small. The out of second world is doing the same thing, but they're taking their light and they're getting har odd harmonics. So it's the first, third, fifth, up to the hundreds of harmonics centered in the um, vacuum ultraviolet, okay? And so they're separating their colors by hundreds and hundreds of terahertz. So I'm kind of like Goldilocks, one's too small, one's too big. And so what I like, got working on is something called multi-frequency Raman generation. It's called different things by different people in the field, but the person who got me into the field called it that, so I'm sticking with it. It's a really beautiful experiment to work with, right? Because it makes all these colors. And this picture doesn't do justice to all the colors because cameras are not nearly as good as our eye. And the three-color system of a camera is not nearly as sensitive as the three-color system in the eyeball. And so when you look at it, you actually see every color distinct across the rainbow. We go from the ultraviolet to the infrared. So we make all of these colors. They're separated, in this case, by a vibrational mode in sulfur hexafluoride. It's the vibrational mode where all six fluoride go in and out, called the breathing mode, so we don't have to worry about rotations. 
Um, it's a nice clean mode, and we can get that. All right, so let me just, because we're in all areas of physics here, this is our biggest diversity, I believe, here, is the fact that our physics is also different. Let me just go back and explain Raman. So Raman did his work in 1920, so he wasn't doing nonlinear work. It is a linear process, and the idea is, is that if you come in and hit a, a molecule with some light, you can either cause it to vibrate or cause it to rotate and you leave the energy then in the system. If you leave the energy in the system, it has to come out of the light. And in this case, it's an inelastic scattering and it changes the frequency of the light. And so the light um, actually loses the energy of the vibrational energy or the rotational energy. So that's the linear process. I don't know why I keep going back. So once the laser came along though, then they had a lot of light, which meant that they generated a lot of this Raman Stokes and they actually coupled these levels and made a lot of um, a strong dipole moment to scatter from. And so you could do a chi-3 nonlinearity, scatter your pump again, and make this light that comes all the way back from the virtual back. And so you actually add this vibrational or rotational level, depending on which Raman level you're doing. Okay? And so this came along once the uh, light was strong enough, thanks to the laser. Oops, I'm still going back. And then by mistake, somebody was just tuning their laser away from center. And when they did that, a lot of the amplified spontaneous emission in the middle of the laser came out almost as strong. It happened to be separated by a Raman level, and they all of a sudden saw, I think it was 39 orders shoot out. Up until then, people hadn't seen it. It was just serendipity. And so that started this whole new field. The idea is, unlike for the people who do know what out of seconds are, that's a totally different effect. It doesn't follow the Taylor nonlinear optical thing at all. This one, though, does. It's just a third order process over and over and over again. So you start with the, oops, no, no, get, get, get back to my talk here. There we go. Um, so you go and you couple this, but now instead of just having one laser and waiting for this one to get strong, start with two strong lasers, which means you really couple this dipole. So you can have 50% population up here. So when you make this Andy Stokes, it can be the one that goes ahead and scatters again and makes another one and another one and another one. You can also go down, okay? But if the point is to make a short pulse, you want to have your center frequency up where you have less than a single femtosecond period so you can make a single femtosecond pulse. And so it's really just a chi 3 process over and over and over again. So how did I get into this? I got into it because, as I say, I, I build lasers that other people don't have, and, and our group had, here had built this two-color uh, amplified short pulse laser. I'm not going to describe it. Uh, but just to know that at the end, in order for nonlinear optics to not happen in your laser, though, you actually stretch your pulses, amplify them, and compress them. But in these experiments that I'll show you, we don't have to perfectly compress them. We can leave them chirped, which means that through the time of the pulse, it can go from red to blue or blue to red. We can also change the timing of the two pulses by putting one of these on a translation stage. That's the back mirror of the gradient. Okay? So this is how I got into the field, though, is that this was back in 2000, yep, 2000. Um, and this is when Russia was not doing well financially. They've gone back and done very well, and I don't know about now. But back then, experimentalists had a really hard time. And so a person working in this uh, field of multi-frequency Raman generation, and he calls it that, Leonid Losev, um, at the Lebedev Institute, contacted me. He said, your laser is the perfect laser to do this work. Can I come over and do the work? I went, absolutely, come on over. So he did. Oh, that just shows that I can, <laughs> I can make the two colors. Uh, and th the point for the Raman isn't what the two colors are. It only matters what the separation is. And so this shows that we can tune the separation. And so we do it in a hollow fiber. And we put the SF6 inside this tube that has the hollow fiber. It gives you a long nonlinear um, interaction length. And this is not the best of the uh, ones, but it went along with my PowerPoint version of the continuum. So I'm using this one. All right, and so that's the idea. We just take our two colors, we time them up, we put them into this hollow fiber, and out comes all these beautiful colors. Um, oops. So the first thing to do, of course, and the goal, is to make all these colors so we can have a short pulse. And so we just first did it as uh, changing the energy. And of course, as you change the energy, you get more pulses. That's what's supposed to happen. Nonlinear processes happen the more light you put on. So that's fine. And then we got to the point where it didn't happen anymore. And we got stuck, and everybody does. And then we'll see that all that happened really was that this continuum sort of showed up around the pump pulses. So we thought this was a different nonlinear optical effect called cell phase modulation, because our pulses are short. 
And other people had seen this too, and so we decided we probably had to stretch our pulses. Now, I just want to show you, though, I want to go back to explain the rest of my talk. You have to understand the Fourier transform again. The number of pulses, you know, how broad this whole spectrum is tells you how short this is. This is just a model, computer model. All right, but how wide each of the individual ones are, and they're not this wide because this is the log scale, but anyways, how wide they are determines how long your pulse train is, right? A mode lock uh, laser pulse has very narrow spectral modes, and so the mode lock train goes on forever. That means the intensity of each pulse is not high. I'm trying to make high intensity short pulses, so I want a short pulse train. So you do want the individual orders to be as broad as possible. So I've got to keep that in mind for the rest of the talk. So we did this study about energy, and then uh, it was my student, Fraser Turner, was getting his master's doing this. And so I said, you know, just to round out your master's thesis, you really should look at dispersion, not just intensity, but let's look at dispersion and see what role that plays about keeping all the colors together and how much does that help um, this process. And then I went away on a camping trip. And, and this is long before anybody carried cell phones with them on a camping trip. I still wouldn't do that, but some people, I guess, do. Um, so no contact. And I come back to one of those great phone messages um, saying, Donna, you should be here in the lab. This is so cool. Everything's happening in the lab and you're missing it. All right. So this is what I was missing. So he decided um, to not take my advice. And he came up with his own idea of saying, before I go to all the trouble to make a very detailed thing with pressure, I'm just going to do a quick and dirty experiment where I'll either cut the intensity by half or cut the uh, pressure in half. And from the, just the nonlinearity, if that's the only thing happening, the picture should look the same. And you can look at these two pictures and, and right away. You don't have to be a scientist in this field to know that those two pictures don't look the same at all. And so this one is the one I already showed you in a way. But I should tell you, we now are using a smaller diameter fiber in order to get negative dispersion from the fiber. I won't explain that. But we wanted to get the dispersion null somewhere in the um, wavelengths we were looking at. And we can do that with this fiber, and we couldn't with the 200 micron fiber. And there's things to notice. One is half the intensity. You don't get as many orders. But now we have this continuum here, but not under the strong pumps. And so it's not what we think it is. But this was the cool picture. He cuts the pressure in half, so the nonlinearity is halved. And yet the green colors come right up, and they're almost the same order of magnitude. Well, they are the same order of magnitude as the pump beams. Okay. There's a huge continuum. It's not sitting here. It's moved over. There's these holes in the continuum. And then there's these, what we call, in our own scientific language, red-shifted shoulders. Okay? We have no other good word for it, red-shifted shoulders. And we saw this, and we went, well, what the heck is going on? You know, none of that can be explained by Raman. And so you know, we looked what other people were, were talking about it. And this is what other people saw. We went back. These people used methane and hydrogen, but also in a hollow fiber. So the experiment, basically the same. And the point is to get many orders. But if you looked at their data, there's, there's red-shifted shoulders, red-shifted shoulders. So it has nothing to do with using SF6, because they're not using SF6. And we scanned their papers, and they don't ever mention it, because of course that's not the point. The point is to get as many orders as possible, so they're not caring. So then I'm at a talk, at a conference, and I'm sitting beside this person, Miu Chan, um, and a colleague, a collaborator of hers, was giving a more global talk about their work, and up comes this picture. Now, they're doing this work in a solid. I, I don't know if this is diamond or not. Does it say what it is? I don't know. They use diamond. They use other things. So, and to get phase matching for them, they take their two colors and they go in at an angle. And then each of the colors that are created comes out at its own angle for phase matching. So they don't have to use a gradient. They're just coming off at every angle that there is. And they just you know, put up a piece of paper and take a picture of it. So that's what we're looking at. But, and these are the Robin orders, these little tiny blobs. And again, you can read this paper. They don't mention all of this, these great big blobs. I can't even tell you what these circles are representing, because that's what their paper's about. I see this, and I go, and I say to Mia Chan, what the heck are those big blobs of light right beside your Robin orders? And she goes, well, we don't really know. But we think it's four-wave mixing. I went, no, because we've studied it enough to know it's not four-wave mixing. But again, they ignored it. And yet, I was there going, how can you ignore it if what we're trying to do is make these picket fence of frequencies to have short pulses, and all the light is going actually into the big blobs. And the big individual big blobs are wider than the Raman orders. A, why aren't we even trying to use these instead of the Raman orders? Um, but don't we just want to know what the heck they are? Okay. 
So um, let me just tell you in my five minutes here, um, how did they do their experiment? They have such short pulses that the two colors can come from the single pulse. So they take the short pulse, they chirp it in time, they split it in two, and they change the timing of the two pulses so the instantaneous frequency separation is the Raman. So these three pictures are taken for three different time delays, and, and they're somehow walking through the resonance here, and, and I don't know what they're looking at, something in those circles. But anyway, you can also see the blobs come and go too as you walk through the resonance. Right. So we did something similar, but our two colors can be made to have the uh, frequency separation here. But we can change the timing because of that mirror in the gratings, and we can walk through the resonance as well. Now I'm just going to apologize because my students will never uh, put the picture this way. But because in Rochester, where we studied optics, light always goes from left to right. So I don't care that people plot time going this way. Light goes this way. And so this is the beginning of my pulse. OK, so these are red chirped pulses where the red at the front, blue at the back. All right, so now we can walk through this resonance. I should have mentioned what four-wave mixing is, though, to tell you why it's not. Four-wave mixing is we're going with our two colors. What if we take our two colors, but we don't make them match the Raman? Let's say they're fairly far away from the Raman level. Then you can still have a chi-3 nonlinear process because our intensities are so high. Two omega up, a small omega down, omega up, and a great big omega down. And so the anti-stokes that would come out from that would then be separated by the separation of the colors of light. Not the separation of the Raman, but the separation of the colors of the light. And so that's what we're going to look for. So now I have a new student working on this by this time, how he wanted to show it this way. So here's the time delay, and these are now blue shifted. These are the colors too far apart. Zero time will be where the colors are lined up to be at the Raman level, and these are shifting to the red. So a few things to notice. If we're blue shifted, nothing happens. The light just comes out where the Raman should come out, except that you get, as you go towards resonance, you get it stronger because it's a resonant phenomenon. All right? But then when you go above, I should tell you, if it's four-wave mixing, though, what we should have are lines. They would be slightly tilted here, and they would get more and more and more tilted, because at the bottom, they would be separated by maybe 23 and a half terahertz, and at the top, they'd be separated by 21 and a half terahertz, OK? And so you would have lines that would look like this, getting long, sloper more and more. That's not at all what we see. We mostly see light that comes straight up, and at some point, seems to hop on over, OK? Why do I keep doing that? So we again look back at some of the old literature and people working in um, the long pulse regime, so they can't look at the individual orders, did notice that when they read detuned, they saw many more orders. And they said this was due to the Stark effect. But we don't have a single photon Stark effect, for those of you who know what that is. I'm not going to explain it. So it has to be a two photon Stark effect. And not many people have uh, studied that, um, but we're, we're trying. Um, so the first thing to look at, though, is it should change with intensity if it is a nonlinear uh, phenomenon. So these are some of the middle orders where we're changing the energy again. And you can see that at the low energy, we get the Raman orders, and then they get broader, but only on the red side. And at the highest energy, we can do quite a bit broader. So we are pretty sure it is this nonlinear effect. We've done some other studies to think that it really is. We could use a theorist's help to really uh, determine it. Uh, but we're at the end, so I'm going to end there. Um, so if, I have to say that we've just uh, received funding from CFI. I don't know if that's actually officially out there yet, but we have. So I will get something called a Dazzler, um, which I've never been able to afford before. That is what I need to put all the colors together. So hopefully soon we will have near single femtosecond pulses. Um, but we are actually looking at the timing now. Um, we, are, we have a frequency resolved optical gate, and we're looking at the chirp of the pulse, pump pulses and the chirp of the next Andy Stokes. Uh, it's showing such weird stuff that I can't, I can't even bother to bring it to you because we have absolutely no idea what it means. But um, that's what we're trying to work on right now. Uh, it is a 10 hertz system, so my colleague Joe probably doesn't want to use it. I have um, a fiber laser, which has a much higher rep rate, so we'll probably switch the whole system. So that's the next thing to do. And of course, I didn't do this work uh, by myself. All these people did. And I do want to thank Leonid Losef for even getting me into the field. Anyways, thank you.